Hello. Um, seems like there was a bit of a glitch and I can see Deepika here with us. Hi Neeta. Alright, I see Deepika sent a request. Hello Khushbu. Hi Alok. Ah, now I have accepted. Wow, finally. Alright, Deepika, how are Fine. you? I'm good, Deepika, but I cannot see you. I can hear, but I cannot see you. I can see you, I can hear you. Um, uh, your, 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 your side of the screen is blank, but I can hear you very clearly. It's such a... Uh, okay, I, a can, can, can everyone else hear and see both of us? Guys, whoever's no, tuning I in. think if I'm not able to, then probably... Shri if I'm not able to, probably others are also not able to see you. No, Shri Priya says we can all see and hear. Oh, that's that's surprising because because then I have to do this live without seeing you. That's 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 very weird. Okay, it gives us a reason to meet in person at some point, so we'll do that for sure. <laughs> yes, we, we can we can definitely do that. But um, will it look good? Because you know I, I I just cannot see you, and the side of the upper side of the screen is absolutely blank for me. It's fine. Doesn't matter. We can do it. Go, let's go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, guys, because uh, there was a little, lot of technical glitch. I formally welcome Vibha. Hello, Vibha. This is the picker this side. And um, sorry for the technical glitch. Instagram does play spoil sports sometimes. So, guys, Vibha is um, India mode. Thank you, Anita. Yeah. So, Vibha Kazi is. Um, she, when I saw what she has done in life, I was like, oh my God, this is like anybody who is into education or who wants to study. It's like a dream TV, you know, talk about the institute and she has in her profile. You talk about Harvard, you talk about Kedney, you talk about London School of um, uh, Eco Economics, any, any particular college and she has under her belt. I am so impressed, Vibha. And would really like to listen it from you. How you chose all those fabulous A grade colleges and you know started your conquest for education. Okay. First of all, Deepika, thank you so much for having me on your live. Uh, it's an absolute honor. You've been doing some fantastic Pleasure. work. It is all mine, Deepika. I really think like as as someone with a strong voice in the space. Uh, you're providing a platform to many other voices as well. So thank you for sharing your platform with me today. Um, in terms of how I went around getting all these qualifications, honestly, I just love learning it. And it all stems from that. And when you want to learn something, ideally, you want to learn from the best. Um, the best is two, two components to anything best on any campus. One is the faculty, which is very obvious. You want the best teachers, you want the best classroom experience. Uh, but what really stands out when you go to a top college is the quality of your peers. It's the quality of the people who, uh, who get attracted to these campuses. So it's twofold. It's the faculty as well as the peer group that really makes the classroom experience uh, simply memorable. And I just wanted to always experience different campuses, big, small, uh, Pittsburgh, which is a small college town where Carnegie Mellon is a highly technical university. Harvard was like epitome of business education. London School of Economics. Growing up in India, we hear of LSC. You know, so I just want to make sure I got a little bit of flavor of different campuses uh, so that I could form my own education thesis uh, based on all these experiences. Trust me, your flavor is too tempting. It is like, you know, dream come true kind of a thing. <laughs> Wait, I seriously like um, when you dream or when you read about something, you know, these are the colleges when they are like epitome, as you said, of their field. And um, you have all of them under one, one that's so, so commendable. And guys, I would also talk about um, uh, Vibha's very close project, her uh, advisory uh, counseling, career counseling um, uh, agency, which 
see when you talk about education education and learning which we has beautifully explained but when we talk about parents and how anxious they are when they see their kids are growing up and very soon they are going to choose their um, streams of education and they would go further for their higher studies that is the place where reachiv.com comes in it is a very close project for vibha who um, pioneered the art of letting people dream big and help them achieve those dreams that's the best example i can think of don't you agree vibha yeah i, I mean honestly uh, when i was dreaming and we're all dreamers right some somewhere somewhere within us we're all dreamers and as a young kid i dreamt a lot i dreamt to be on these amazing campuses and to be quite honest i didn't have the right guidance i didn't have you know at that time my parents hadn't been abroad no one really knew about these universities and how to get into these sort of premium institutions and that lack of guidance and that lack of support really really became uh, a, a weakness that i wanted to turn into a strength for somebody else moving on and that was really the reason i started the organization to help people who were a high potential to get channelized into the right direction and also you know we spend so many years of our lives just doing things that we're not designed to do maybe because family told us society tells us the world around us you know thinks oh this is a good career option or some something from social media today influences us uh, but they're not thoroughly well researched career decisions so as a mentorship sure. platform we want to show we help people truly figure out their own ek guys their why is in life why what who and then figure out which university so the universities and all that comes second first we really try to figure out who am i and what is really my purpose in uh, of life and then basis that you move on to every next decision in life i so agree with you because you know i remember uh, i won't say how many years because that will reflect my age but years years ago i wanted to be in foreign services and i had so less knowledge about it and you know it always felt like a far fetched team and as you said like they, we did not have that kind of a, a periphery or we did not have that kind of peers who could guide us and everybody said nay 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 foreign services is for the people who come from that particular background and i today when i think about it like wish i could have done something about it you know it's like uh, we couldn't do it but at the same time we wish our kids to dream and to help them to achieve dreams so um I need to ask this question, Vibha, if you don't mind. Um, what is the right time when parents and uh, kids should start thinking about career counseling? Because I know, in fact, I can see Ruchi Verma has also just mentioned, like she needs to connect with you for her daughter. There are a lot of people who um, are not sure that okay, this is my kid is going to be in twelfth or my kid is going to be tenth. Uh, what is the right time for higher education career counseling? Okay, that's a very important question, Deepika. Because, uh, as we all know, like timing is everything. Now, there's no perfect age to intervene. Uh, each child is unique. Each child requires intervention at a different time. Formal counseling for students we only begin at the seventh grade and onwards. Before that, we feel it's too early for these kind of conversations around serious career counseling. So, from seventh grade onwards, we feel they're more receptive to career counseling. also by this point they've experimented with a few extra curriculars they've tried their hands at cricket or table tennis or whatever their sport might be their musical instrument parents have given them some sort of base level exposure at the 7th grade we intervene because when you apply to universities abroad everything you do from the 9th grade onwards is put into the application and the 7th grade is a good time to start thinking about okay what direction do i want to go in what kind of career might i want to pursue and you start providing an enabling environment and the right opportunities for the child to be able to start moving towards that answer we're not expecting a seventh grader to say hey i want to become a digital marketing expert or a doctor or whatever we're just saying we're going to start this conversation so by the time you hit the 9th 10th 11th 12th at whatever point that aha moment happens for you at least you started having that conversation earlier and parents also understand oh okay this is what my child needs this is the direction because we realize a lot of times in our counseling session a lot of conversations happen between parents and children which you might wonder like why aren't the parents and children communicating on their own time but uh, it just so happens that 
a lot of questions when we throw out as counselors and the child responds and the mother and father go oh okay we didn't know this why didn't you tell us beta why didn't you have this conversation with us so sometimes we wonder like was it the child or was it the parent who basically didn't bother to ask or didn't know whether they should be asking these kind of questions so a lot of unraveling happens a lot of communication between all parties happens and i think by the 7th grade everyone is mature enough to have those conversations we also do only parent counseling wherein we might help a parent who might be struggling with a child who may be even 5 6 7 years of age and says look here's what i'm struggling with and i'd like to fix this early on enough so that by the time my child is ready for your sessions this base level issue is resolved so those could be issues uh, to deal with i don't know obedience or uh, lack of interest in a specific extracurricular or academics or wanting to shift schools not knowing what board to put your child in what board is ideal for my child those kind of things come up in parent counseling where they want to know like what should we as parents be doing as enablers for our children um so yeah yes i i i agree to that because you know i often said in my communication classes uh, during my academia time like we get more candid with strangers than our own peers because there is always this Uh, you know this fear of being judged by them probably that is the reason kids are very elusive these days and they don't open up in front of parents as they should be this is what like i i personally believe or thought think um, that is one of the causes uh, coming on to my second question viva uh, as you said that there are these challenges you know wherein the kids um, are not sure or probably there are some other challenges which you as an expert would be able to guide us more so what are these challenges when it comes to um career counseling and advising about the career and are these challenges uh, can these challenges be improved or improvised on are you talking challenges from a counseling perspective or from the from the parent and child perspective? both 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 uh, from the counseling perspective as well and from the kids and the parents perspective as well okay so as, as we identified already the primary issue we face as counselors and as parents and children internally is communication so i think someone on the chat has even asked like how do we help solve this communication gap it's honestly to solve any communication gap like you know when you run a business they pick up they say when you're running a business you want a successful business start listening to the customer you know so same way i always tell parents listen listen to your child stay tuned to what the child is saying what is he asking where is the child expressing a need to express what is the child expressing a need to explore you know there's a lot of unfortunate superimposing uh living vicariously through a child and it you know this is not a generational thing that happened three generations ago i'm seeing it even now so this is something that parents really i wish they would just fix that and create an open communicative environment in the household a lot of parents obviously now both parents are working in many many cases it's become very normal which is great because this whole gender inequity the child doesn't see it growing up it's just like oh, both my parents were working and that's great that's a nice environment to have but in that situation where both parents are out at work make sure there is defined agreed upon time to have conversations with your children sometimes you can even make the conversation structured saying guys we're going to be talking as a family today and today's 30 minutes are going to be we're going to first talk entirely about school or what would you want to do later or is this a and then you can say okay so after the 30 minute formal conversation we can just have fun we can watch tv together go watch a movie whatever but just designing the communication also is very helpful so everybody knows that we're going to be talking for 30 minutes about a specific topic and also ensuring the parents are equally vulnerable so it's not putting the child on the spot and the child feeling like oh am i going to be judged or my parents are going to be happy with me it's great if the parents can li- literally loosen up and be like look when i was 10 i didn't know i was lost i you know probably failed at a certain subject or a course or, or whatever you might have you know so the child starts thinking this is normal and is un- and is open up and then he starts talking about their own issues so i think really parents need to really start tuning into what are children saying that's number one two i find a lot of lack of exposure uh you know and in, in fact it's very interesting sometimes parents i talked with are 
amazing career professionals like for example in your case you know you have such a strong command over social media as an influencer someone with a lot of knowledge on parenting blogging etc so i always tell parents look education and career education begins at home first you teach your child what you know best two parents now working that means two careers immediately you can expose your child to it's very interesting i'll meet children i say what is dad do he says oh he does something in finance oh we run some sort of factory i say oh, but have you been do you know what he does and i would say in more than 50% of the cases the exposure ends there because for some reason it's compartmentalized saying oh he's too young he's only uh, in the 8th standard 9th standard right now let him focus on school of course he must focus on school but early exposure to at least what both parents are doing or within the family uncle aunt somebody is doing is a really good place to start and very early is always good for career exposure i remember very early when my grandfather used to be selling some paper and some books etc very very early on we got exposed to trade and how he thinks and that very early exposure it probably happens in marwadi families very commonly uh, but very very helpful you know it helps you at least get some context of how business is done and it's great bonding with intergenerational bonding uh, is a fantastic thing to happen to your child so through through intergenerational bonding expose them with as i said with other family members maybe uncle aunt cousin so the child also develops bonds with these people and as a parent ideally know your limitation please know that look i only know i own my circumference of reference or radius of information is might be big but it's still limited and the minute you as a parent say acknowledge with humility that look we can only do this much but look we need a coach to help with his career we need so and so uncle to help with this aspect and then you start tapping into the wider network as opposed to thinking that oh we have all the answers we don't really need uh, an outsider to come in and tell us how to teach our child you know so the minute these three things get fixed i think you have a pretty good uh, overall ecosystem for your child right right so i'm so glad to know that communication still wins the charge because i often create content and write about how important communication is when it talks because you know i write write on thoughtful parenting and thoughtful parenting is um, nothing to do with like being too lenient or being too helicopterish or anything like that it's just like you have to be have a one on one open kind of a relationship with your kid and communication open communication means a lot and i'm so glad that you uh, categorically say that communication means a lot when it comes to challenges even in higher education so uh, coming to the topic which we have in hand diversity causes mouth so what is the role of diversity and inclusion means in higher education and um, is it really important now that we know india is growing it is fifth largest economy and we are growing at a very progressive speed so uh, do we still face these kind of issues when it comes to going abroad or foreign universities or colleges and if yes how to tackle it okay so i'm really glad you're asking about this on many lives i've done with with parenting influencers they don't bring up diversity and inclusion so i'm really glad you're touching upon this nerve uh, it's a very sensitive topic and i i think it really needs to be spoken about so first of all thank you for bringing up this issue in a country as vast as india uh, 1.3 billion and if you take that and juxtapose it to a foreign university where you suddenly have 7 and a half billion world population uh, we're talking about a lot of diversity now how would you define diversity in an educational perspective one is the obvious definition of diversity in terms of just the way you look right and the religion and the caste and all all the sort of base level diversity that we already challengingly deal with in india different religions different languages different cultural beliefs different societal beliefs different economic strata within the classroom we are really baffled with the quantum of diversity you would deal with even if you go to a school in a certain region of bombay or delhi where you say oh this is all south delhi schools obviously they'll all be the same it's a misnomer because they come from different families with different cultural and social economic ideologies and it all shows in the classroom when the kids are together now throw in the complexity of india's overall diversity with new found diversity in terms of learning disabilities right 
that's become a really big thing it wasn't it probably existed back in the day when we were all in school etc but it wasn't addressed or spoken about if i think back upon my classroom i can definitely think about one or two people who probably just generally had some sort of learning disabilities that weren't addressed now thankfully some schools are bringing this to the forefront and discussing it but there is a diversity in learning styles of every student in that classroom therefore there is a topper and then therefore there's a top 10% because for that top 10% i don't necessarily think for example i was a top 10% in my school i really don't think i was so exceptionally different i just felt like oh the learning style actually just worked for me and therefore translated into my grades i think if you put somebody like me in a different classroom or different way of teaching i probably would not have succeeded you know it has nothing to do with how smart or dumb a student is is just the learning ability and methodology whether it appeals or not so that's another kind of diversity uh in a classroom and uh yeah i think just toss up the cultural diversity with the learning disability and with the economic disparity in india and the language disparity right because we all speak different languages at home and then you get thrown into a classroom and you say okay everyone forget your home languages so i think there is a lot of diversity going on in a classroom and the same thing imagine this now amplified 20x 100x in an international classroom where you say forget one country now we're going to pull in my classroom at harvard at people from 50 different countries so you can just imagine the mind boggling diversity that you're thrown into and it's really is a miracle that these universities abroad make the diversity work so yeah there's a lot of diversity going on it's definitely an issue that people need to tackle how nice is that like i'm i'm amazed to know about howard um, so it says like if so many people are coming from different cultures and different uh, places how beautiful and colorful that place would be you know this reminds me my time in melbourne when i was working with a and z people uh, they accepted asian because asians were like growing very well in education front and work front and everything but there was this particular kind of a you know take back scenario wherein they were not very really keen to have asians around especially because we were eating up their job so i understand there are lot of things in diversity apart from uh, as you said that ethnic uh, racism and uh, as well as uh, learning disability so coming back to the, my next question when uh, this derives from the same diversity and inclusion topic how can universities make space for this diverse culture because as you said harvard then again harvard is one of the epitome right there are other colleges also not everybody who aim for harvard will get through harvard there would be like uh, a second form or third form or fifth list seventh list kind of colleges so how colleges can create a culture which include diversity and inclusion at the best okay cool let's 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 address this and i hope some institutions are listening to us talk um forget harvard i think we we can just take this conversation to any university even our home grown university here right here right here in india because we talked about the diversity challenges in one country or even one city right uh first and foremost if you want to create a diverse environment make sure you are taking in so the student recruitment process should be very clearly tuned into wanting diversity this is a really big thing on campuses because we help with admissions to universities every year we speak to admissions and they and if you talk to any admissions officer they will say we are looking to build a diverse classroom that's the first thing they tell you in india if you really want to build diversity make sure you have equal representation i'm not going to get equal representation because it's very hard to define equal representation but make sure you are at least at the outset thinking about oh how can we ensure there's a diversity in our classroom what happens in an indian system there is no thought behind creating a diverse classroom the only thought is how much is the cut off be how much is the cut off at st xavier's how much is the cut off at stephens there's no thought given to like who is this individual where does he come from what's the background it's a simple cut off system or they have reservations and reservations is a whole other topic which we can definitely talk about whether it's good bad or ugly but essentially there's no thought given to you know there's no academic selection process there there's no selection process it's just like oh you got the cut off you're in or you're out so that's that's the first mistake we are making here in india you're not looking at the individual and saying oh let's craft a diverse profile maybe he doesn't have 99% but hey look such an interesting background he also did this she also did that 
so crafting crafting a classroom that's diverse very important second is ensuring the faculty and administration is also as diverse think about an american situation where you say oh let's have diversity in the classroom and we have hispanics black americans white americans indians chinese koreans we have a super classroom and then you go into the university and the professors are all white it's just going to create a really weird contrast because obviously the white professors come in like, oh we don't know how to deal with this diversity so ensuring that that balance is maintained in diversity both in the faculty members as well as the student base now if you're going to recruit a diverse faculty and student body then you got to make sure as an administration you're thinking about making the policies also inclusive because if you don't think about inclusive policies then at some point your class your balance is going to suffer so policy making needs to be very tuned into what do different diversities need what sort of support they need and then providing them that support and also providing an environment that's very conducive to diversity which could mean having uh, a mentor or a center for diversity which are many campuses have started having right now where you can go in and talk about diversity challenges inclusive inclusivity challenges and someone from the university again is hearing your issues so there are many many things you can do but you know for in the interest of time i would say these are my top 3 suggestions to uh, faculty members around the world thank you vibha and i'm so glad that you have actually answered my next question because i was about to ask you how faculties and staff members of the universities and colleges can actually play a role in creating and fostering this diverse culture i'm glad that you have answered because it was definitely a part of the same um, rhetoric but uh, on a second note yes. i just wanted to know one that one thing to from a teaching perspective like for a faculty member per se cuz uh, i was trying to talk earlier about like what more administratively they could do from a faculty member perspective really it's it's a very challenging thing it's very easy for us to sit around and say it so loosely but really trying to figure out inclusive teaching practices because uh, you know any classroom and i'm sure both you and i have been uh, at a speaker situation in a classroom and uh, it's it's really challenging you know because you're suddenly in a class i was i was day before i was in pune and i felt like half the room was really tuned into what i was saying they were ans- answering my questions very engaged and then i had half the classroom who just i don't think they understood anything of what i was saying and i was just like man if i had to teach this classroom english or math or whatever um i would be in a really difficult situation because there's no reception on one end so how do you you know when on one end we say take a diverse classroom and then on one end we say okay now teacher teach a diverse classroom so it's it's a very difficult situation you know how do you expect the teacher to teach a lot of schools because of this inclusivity now are saying oh we'll take learning disability so uh, ambani school has someone who's blind you know completely visually impaired a uh, bombay international a friend of mine's daughter her, she's hearing impaired so the schools want to be inclusive and say oh, okay you know we want to put out this message saying please come we'll be inclusive we'll give your child this environment but from a teacher's perspective this is a really complex job so then training the teacher on inclusivity training the teacher on how do you handle disability that that is really a big task and hats off and really my salute to the teachers who do this on a day to day basis because i know it's not an easy job but but is it required yes absolutely yes because you have to provide an even working space to all children right right absolutely agree and i think it has got to do too much of the psychological barrier also for teachers because they have to be very sensitive towards needs and inclusivity uh, diversity and inclusive decisions of all the uh, kids as well as the management decisions of implementing something which probably they must have not thought through properly or they just like bulldoze the kind of decisions and then teachers have to take the brunt of it because i'm i'm talking from a very ground level point of view we understand that big institutes like you have given example of a money school and uh, big uh, a grade schools colleges they have good infrastructure they have proper support but when you talk about such particular decisions in the ground level colleges or schools there comes the big uh, tussle between you know the faculty and the management so yes coming back to our uh, discussion and hand i have always talked about um, since covid we know since covid we know that education has become online earlier uh, it was not that big um, situation in india especially 
but now with technology and the um, online classes the whole globe has become you know just click away so how do you think diversity and inclusion play a role in technical and online education okay that's also a very very good question now honestly it in my opinion it plays out in both ways it it works in favor and against uh, diversity uh in terms of how it works in favor it's great to have you know if we're talking about bridging the socio economic gap when you have courses taught by faculty members from harvard and nyu and george washington and all these really fancy universities suddenly available on coursera for free you are now saying hey it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you got in to these fancy universities here's all the knowledge you would potentially garner at one of these top schools accessible to you for free from home uh, and now we're going to really equalize the social landscape so by providing these online courses etc i feel definitely there is some you know the thought is at least like let's provide some form of equity to from a socio economic perspective uh, from a learning perspective I, you know I, as i spoke about the learning disability and certain students being tuned into a certain kind of learning i really feel this is this online teaching and learning is detrimental in terms of equity because for some people it works honestly i've tried it i've tried these courses online and try to passively garner information it just doesn't work for me i can't i can't sit in front of a screen and self learn beyond a certain point uh even learning through webinars even when there's a guided instruction at some point it i just tune out i just i can't sustain hours of screen time but for some people it works really well you know uh, some people like self study for some people online instruction is great so uh, again it can work for or against depending on the learning style but when you make it all pervasive and say okay everyone needs to learn like this then you are doing a disservice to equity and diversity because it's not working for me and now you've not given me another choice but definitely i like the endeavor to bring coursework etc at very very low prices uh, because how many people end up going to mit and harvard and stanford right every year so the fact that they even thought of putting out these courses providing online education at very very low cost it's great but as we all know a lot of the online courses also have now started adding certification or ramped up the prices some of them go in lakhs of rupees so you know you have to be careful about what part of this whole dei movement you want to be privy to and when you when are you smart enough to say hey this has become a money making racket it's not really uh, solving any dei issue so that that of course is parent and child discretion but as long as you're smart about which opportunity you're taking at least there is an endeavor at least there's an option today which didn't exist 10 to 15 years ago i could not go and do a course by harvard online 15 years ago so i'm glad that you know, there is some there's an effort and an ethos towards reducing the socio economic gap yes so when it comes to socio economic gap it definitely is a plus point but as you said like taking knowledge hands on going there and learning it's like different from what coursera offers because i have also done couple of certifications from coursera in my free time and i can clearly see the difference because the course which i did had something to do with communication because i am a communication coach so i could see how huge the difference is the gap of online and offline education is obviously huge but even the principles are detrimental of learning so i i absolutely agree so this this complete our um, questionnaire uh, to be honest with her but i would like to have one more question which has been asked by uh, the participants here when they ask like uh, first is how communication gap can be improved when you talk about going into foreign universities because i believe like some universities not everybody is going to go in harvard or mit if they are going to a different uh, country wherein the language is a barrier or where the communication is a barrier how they work on it do they take extra classes or do they take um, edu- uh, l- learning for the particular uh, language how do they work about it okay so you know most uh, most universities even if they are in germany or france etc they'll always mostly have dual instruction classes so they teach the classes both in a foreign language as well as, as in english um so it's not you know i would i would say that if you don't 
speak a foreign language, then please don't go choose Spanish or French or German as the medium of instruction. I mean, it's a uh, it's career suicide. Even if you think you're really smart and oh, over the summer I'll do two months of French and I'll pick it up. Um, if you're planning to go into an environment that's very French and they will only teach in French, I would not I would not suggest doing it. You might want to ease your way into that sort of classroom by maybe spending a year learning in English, but also then spending an entire year learning a foreign language. But the the thrill of being in a country like Germany or France or Spain or somewhere where you know the primary language is not English is is amazing. Um, I don't think you should pick is the as a primary medium of instruction the foreign language, but most definitely uh, explore the culture. Take courses on Duolingo again on a lot of these apps. Immersion is the best way to learn. So I learned French when I was in school. I went to the Alliance Française, and then I went to France to actually be immersed in the local culture. I enrolled in a local school uh, to learn the language, which is always great to have a native person teach you the language. That's a big gap I felt here in India when you know you try to learn German or French or something from someone who's learned it in theory. So theoretically they're very strong, but when you go to that foreign country, you realize that oh my god, my accent is completely off. So my suggestion is, guys, if you are going to go abroad, and please learn from a native speaker. Uh, definitely, they know, you know, the, they know the slang. They know colloquially how something is spoken, and just by talking and listening to them, you'll be able to quickly ramp up. I'm also a big believer in pop culture. So if you want to pick up a language, the really cool way to understand it is, and I did this a lot for my French, is listen to music. Watch movies, everything in that foreign language, because you'll also start picking up on culture. If you watch French cinema, I don't know, Dipika, have you seen any French cinema? It really gives you an insight into French people, how they think, what their culture is, what their relationship dynamic is. I mean, it's really crazy. It's a little, it's very different from how Indians operate. So that cultural understanding, along with language upskilling, is is very helpful. Um, yeah, but as as I always say, like keep listening. You know, listening is the first and foremost step of any form of communication. Before you speak, you must learn to listen. Right, right. Thank you so much. I will definitely tell this to my kid who is like in sixth grade. And this reminds me, as you said, that from seventh grade we should start thinking about it. I will be reaching you once she will be in seventh grade. And uh, thank you so much for your time, Vibha. I had a very interesting session from someone who has. So much of knowledge to share with all of us. I think 30 minutes will not justify things which you can share with us. I would love to be a part of one of your sessions when you're teaching kids. Visit there and uh, try to gain some knowledge, some insights on how you are um, creating uh, those, uh, you know, aspiring those people, the kids, to take their dreams ahead. And thank you for your time. I will be sharing this live as IGTV. I hope you too enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you so much, Kumar Deepika, because you really touched upon a topic that I don't get a chance to talk about, and I think it's a topic that a lot of people need to hear about. So I thought your line of questioning, the kind of research you put into the topic, was extremely commendable, and I hope to be able to have further conversations with you, and we can pick up different topics that would be relevant to parents and children alike. And take it forward. So, and for your child, a hundred percent. Within a year, we'll be on on track with your child for sure. Thank you, thank you so much. I look forward to it, Vibha. Thank you for your time. Thank you. It was lovely having you online. Absolutely, thank you.